such thing when I was a kid. It did not exist. You had kids' church, Stacy? Yeah. Yeah. I know the church you went to. Yeah, you were lucky. You're very fortunate. There was no such thing as kids' church when I was a kid. And there was no such thing as nice adults when I was a kid either, as far as I can remember. That. <laughs> I don't remember like any happy Sunday school teachers that liked children. Yeah, I, I may be a little jaded in my memory, but it just seems that way. So they've got it made back there. But seriously, you'd be praying for those kids. I know Mrs. Price was dealing with one about salvation after Sunday school this morning. Mm -hmm. And I'll be praying that as those kids hear the gospel preached, there are some new ones that are there today that have not yet heard the gospel. And 
there are some that are waiting on their parents to get permission for them to be baptized. And so you be praying for the youth in our church. Literally, that is not, it's not just saying it to say that that, that is our future. Uh, I heard, I think it was, I read an article by someone that said that within 15 years, they're saying that 15% of Americans will profess to be Christians or be evangelical Christians. That's the direction that we're going. I don't, I don't personally buy into that. I don't believe that. What I'm seeing right now is that people are getting saved all over the place. And everybody I meet that gets saved says, I don't really think anybody's getting saved. I'm the only one I know. But I'm just telling you, I'm meeting all kinds of people that are coming to know Jesus. And it's, it's one of those things where it is transformational. God is saving and transforming lives. And people are turning to Jesus. And that's the hope of our nation. But my friend, you cannot legislate Christianity more than Constantine could. He got him a good Catholic church started, but he didn't make anybody a believer. And the fact of the matter is, is that as believers, if we think that we're going to elect politicians that are going to make our country a moral country or turn us back to Jesus, we're greatly mistaken. But I'll tell you what will change our nation and what will change our churches is if God's people will humble themselves and pray and seek His face. And we need that. We've been studying in Nehemiah on Wednesday nights and been seeing that it only takes one person to have an individual revival. All it takes is one person that just acknowledges the, and confesses and turns to Jesus and accepts the responsibility for living for Christ like a Nehemiah did and it literally affect and change an entire nation and change our churches. We need revival, my friend. If I were to ask every person what's wrong with the church today, you could point out all kinds of symptoms. But ultimately what we need is to turn to the Lord Jesus. God is so much of an afterthought in the life of the average Christian today. He is so much of an afterthought when it comes to priorities and serving that, my friend, the only thing that will change is if, if we have that renewed turning again to Jesus and love of God with all our hearts. Well, here we are in Matthew chapter 2, and we have begun a study in Matthew. Now, I, in some ways, wish that the Holy Spirit had led for us to be in this area when the calendar year began at, in December, but we're just a little bit early, and here we are in Matthew 2. Hey, good to see you, Obed. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 2. And so here we are today, and I want to look at just the theme that we'll find in this passage of Scripture that we're going to see as we preach through Matthew. So here we are, and I want to read verses 1 through 3, and then I would also like to read verse... Um, oh, I made a mistake. Yeah, verses 1 through 3, and then uh, I want to read verses 7 through 10. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Now pay attention to verse 3. When Herod the king had heard all these things, he was troubled, wow, and all Jerusalem with him. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that was. Now, I want to just read verse 10 as well. This is speaking of the wise men. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. And then we'll look at verse 11. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and silver, frankincense and myrrh. Let's pray and ask the Lord to give us understanding and to challenge us by the preaching of the Word. God, exactly that is what we need. We need to be understanding of the truth of the Scripture. God, we also need to be challenged today. Lord, there today in this passage of Scripture are two responses to Your Word. There are two responses to truth. One response is to believe and to rejoice. The other response is to be troubled and to not believe. And I pray that You would help us to see literally this simplistically as we look at all matters pertaining to to our Lord and Savior Jesus, and to your work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've learned a long time ago, I don't know when it was exactly that occurred to me, but I learned a long time ago that when it comes to believing, facts have very little to do with anything. Isn't it true? I mean, the thing is, is that what is factual is actually truth. And I'm not for uh, for uh, in any means this morning saying that there's no such thing as truth or there, there are no exact facts. I'm just saying that facts have nothing to do 
with what people believe. Isn't it true? Uh, have you read the headlines lately? Uh, I love the, the phrase, fake news. And uh, I, I'm not trying to be political this morning, I just think it's funny. And whenever somebody tells me something I disagree with, I just call them fake news. You're fake news. You know, it's a good answer for somebody. And, uh, the, but the fact of the matter is, is that there is a lot of fake news. I mean, it's just on all sides. I was reading something the other day about our president, something that someone who didn't like the president wrote, and I thought, you know, I don't know if it was about Russia. The Russia thing is still being, you know, discussed, being talked about. It was about Russia, and it was somebody that was being interviewed, and they basically stated that they factually knew that the advisors of our president during the election had colluded with Russia, and it was a fact. And I thought, you know, if I wanted to believe that, I would. I mean, here's a guy who should know, who says that if people knew what he knew, they would know that the president colluded with Russia. And I thought, you know what? If I wanted to believe that, I would. I sure would. And I would sort, I would sort, man, i got some funny words today. I would <coughs> cite that individual as my source and say, here's a guy that knows and he says. So it's a fact. But I was thinking, and if I didn't want... By the way, I don't know what to believe. To be honest with you, I just really don't know. I also don't know whether O.J. Simpson actually killed his wife or not. I, you know, I think he did. But I just actually don't personally know. I don't know. But I know just about everybody has an opinion about it. Everybody believes something about it. Now, if you were to tell me that you believe that O.J. Uh, murdered his wife... You could give me sources and you could state what you believe, right? And you'd be very sincere in it. And if you believe that O.J. was innocent, you... Good try. <laughs> I don't think anybody here believes he's innocent. <laughs> you could give your reasons and your sources. I remember this. I remember being a rookie preacher. I was just out of Bible college. I was working as assistant pastor. And Dr. McClure had me teach the adult class. And I asked, how many of you all know that O.J. Simpson is guilty in my Sunday school class? And I remember it was 100%. Everybody raised their hands. And I said, how do you know? And honestly, there was nothing that they knew that would have held up in a court of law. You could say, well, pastor, there was evidence that was not, was not allowed in the court because of... And, you, and the fact of the matter is, is that the investigators were questionable. And so you couldn't, you didn't know what to, if you're honest about it, you really don't know whether he's guilty or innocent on the basis of what I could know and on the basis of what you could know. But almost everybody believes something, don't they? See, what I'm telling you is that facts have very little to do with what a person sincerely believes. I'm not saying there isn't truth. Because the truth is, is he's either innocent or guilty. Right? And God knows and He knows and that's the truth. But with regard to what truth is, usually our slight or our bent to believe a particular thing influences what we believe far more than the facts actually do. I hope our president is innocent of collusion with the Russians. And I'm not sure even what the collusion would be in the election. I'm not sure exactly even with whether there would be... I, don't, I hope he's innocent. But I actually don't know. I really don't know. And uh, he doesn't have the kind of character where I'd say, based on his character, I know he's innocent. I'm not bashing our president today. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying, I don't know. But I know people that believe very, very strongly that he's innocent. And I know people believe very, very strongly that he's guilty. And they have this, they're working with the same facts that I'm working with. And I don't know. And so let's deal with this this morning with regard to the birth of Jesus Christ. I, I, I know I'm not trying to switch from being silly to serious. I didn't even mean to be silly this morning. I was just trying to illustrate my point. But, the, the, but what I want us to understand is that there we have to, to a certain degree, be honest and open enough to allow facts to influence us more than we allow our bent or our belief. Isn't it so? I mean, the truth of the matter, and I don't want to say this in the wrong kind of way, but... There are people that are going to heaven that I don't want to affiliate myself with or associate myself with. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there are some, I'm just to be honest with you, there are some people who, are, who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who have trusted Christ as their Savior, 
And I'm not talking about, you know, they've done anything terrible. I'm just talking about they got such a stinking attitude that I really just don't even want to be affiliated with them. And, you know, I tend to think that anybody that were to see them would not believe anything that they say on the basis of what the Scripture teaches simply because of the messenger. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, I don't want to be that way. And I think every one of us is guilty to some degree, at least from somebody's perspective of the same. But as believers, you and I ought to be the... If there's anybody in the world who has open minds enough to see truth and to look at facts and to make decisions on the basis of those, it ought to be Christians. You as a believer ought to ever be threatened by someone who questions. You know, I've seen it before. I have been in classrooms. I've been in services where somebody's asked questions and I had the same question. And because the person asked the question didn't know, their response was to just kind of nuke the person who asked the question. Or say, what kind of a question is that? Now, sometimes I have to tell people the qu that's the wrong question. You know, there's not a, always a wrong answer. Sometimes there's a wrong question, right? There's, a, there's no right answer for the question. It's intended to be that way. Jesus was asked questions like that quite frequently, wasn't He? You know, should a man pay taxes to Caesar? There's no right answer to that question with the, for the audience that was there. You know, it's like the question, have you stopped beating your wife? There's no right answer to that question. Is there? You know, I mean, the only right answer is wrong question. I've never beat my wife. So I have not stopped beating my wife, and I haven't started beating my wife. That's the answer. It's the wrong question. You understand what I'm saying? And a lot of times, unbelief asks the wrong question, and then when you feel as though you're forced, so you've got to be articulate enough to say, well, there's no right answer to that question. It's a dishonest question. The question is not intended to, to find facts. The question is intended to discredit anybody who tries to answer it. And as believers, we ought to be able to see through that. But we also ought to understand that, listen, if what we believe is the truth, we're not threatened by anybody that would question whether Jesus is God, for instance. You know, a person who's lost, a person who's deciding whether or not they're going to believe in Jesus, ought to have answered with finality to them the question, is Jesus God? That's a valuable question. And if somebody questions and says, I don't see how Jesus could be God to you, you ought to open the Word of God and show them how. And that's actually something that's answered in the Word of God today. Another question that everybody ought to have is, how do I know the Bible is God's Word? How do I know I can trust or I can believe the Bible? You know, everything's conjecture if you believe that the Scripture has mistakes in it. It's a fact. You know, I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse. But there's a reason that we use a copy of the Scripture in our church that reflects preservation. The reason we use the King James Version of the Scripture in our church is because it comes from the only text that believes that there aren't mistakes or that there aren't lost things in the Word of God. See, the Bible promises that God will preserve His Word. And if the Bible promises preservation and there are mistakes in it, then I can't trust God. So either it's true that I can trust God, either it's true that God preserved His Word, or everything that is a foundation for me to believe in is just a farce. And the fact that I'm trying to preach and tell you that there's such thing as this is right and this is wrong and you ought to believe this and you shouldn't believe that is just based on something entirely dishonest because I don't even believe the Word of God is, is flawless or that it is preserved and that it is without error. you understand the importance of that? In other words, we, we have to settle those matters or everything we believe is just up for debate. And then it really comes a debate of which, what would you prefer to believe? What people do you prefer to align yourselves with? See, we don't, we don't believe like that, do we? We want to know what truth is and we want to align ourselves with whom? I hope you know this. God. God. I hope everybody's sleeping on that. <laughs> okay. Yes, we want to find out what truth is. We know God's a source of truth and we want to align ourselves with God. And when everybody lines themselves up with God, we'll line up with each other, but we want to know the facts. Okay, so the last several weeks that we've been in Matthew, we've looked particularly at the kind of people that God uses and specifically one of the things uh, that we began with was just looking at the book of the generation or the generations of Jesus Christ and we looked at the people that were included 
in that promise, Jesus Christ being the Messiah, the promised Savior, born of a virgin, which was promised to Eve. Do you remember in Genesis 3? That Eve was promised that the seed of the woman is going to be the one that bruises the serpent's head. That's a prophecy of the virgin birth and of the Messiah. The seed comes from the man, not from the woman. So it was a prophecy of a miraculous birth. And Jesus Christ was born in that. But in that, in that seed line, we see, saw individuals that really oughtn't to have belonged. Individuals as varied as Tamar and Ruth and Bathsheba and Rahab. Boy, there's a gamut as far as personal character and the history of those individuals. What was the thing that those individuals had in common in being included in the line of Jesus Christ? Well, each of the ones that I just mentioned, except for Bathsheba, of course, would have been excluded on the basis of their ethnicity if they hadn't been included in God's plan through belief. But what those individuals had in common was the fact that they had faith in God, that they believed in Jesus Christ. And my friend, I think that we find in the genealogies of the Lord Jesus Himself one of the most wonderful promises, and that's that God can use anybody. God can use anyone. I find the greatest comfort in the kind of people that God uses. I love it that this book isn't dishonest like most religious books are. Most religious books hide up and cover the deceitfulness and the discrepancy of the people who are their leaders. You ever try to find something honest from the Mormons about Brigham Young? I dare you. Try to find something honest from the Mormons about Joseph Smith. I dare you. They won't tell you those men had murdered scores, not like a couple of people. Both of those men were responsible for nearly a thousand murders individually, not collectively. They were some of the greatest rascals and murderers in the world. Try to find something honest about Mohammed. Try to find something honest about the man, honestly true, from his followers. My friend, you won't. You'll find cover-up after cover-up after cover-up where if people were actually to say the things that Muhammad did, you would be slandering their leader. But you know, the Bible's pretty honest about some of the terrible things uh, that people who believed in God did. You know, Abraham, thank God for his faith and his example of faith, which is even used in Romans to illustrate that salvation is by faith alone and not with the works of the law. Thank God for Abraham, but man was a lousy husband and a lousy father. But thank God that the Scripture records that. The Bible tells us what marriage should be, and it tells us what Abraham was, but God used him anyway. And I thank God that the Scripture doesn't cover that up. See, it isn't a perfect person that follows Jesus. It's a perfect Savior that's required. I don't think there ever was a worse family man than Jacob. I don't think there was ever possibly a worse father in the world. I'm just telling you, I honestly don't know if there could have been a worse father than Jacob. He was a terrible parent. A terrible example of what a man ought to be. I don't think there could be a worse husband than Jacob. Ladies, how would you like to be married to Jacob? I don't think you could find a worse man to be married to than Jacob, but God used him. And the Scripture records that. And it's not, you know, I've had people say, matter of fact, I heard, <laughs> this embarrasses me, but I heard an independent fundamental preacher preach uh, that, that it was okay in the Old Testament to marry multiple wives. And I thought, my goodness, I wish you'd read your Bible sometime. Because the Bible defines marriage in Genesis as a man and a woman. And then in the law, it forbids, uh, it forbids uh, polygamy. And it certainly, specifically forbids it among kings. And I heard a preacher a couple weeks ago who was really preaching a message that just was against marriage, basically. I don't know if that was his, I don't think that was his heart's intent. But... And he said that the Old Testament teaches, no, the Old Testament taught that polygamy was wrong, and that's why the Scripture recorded it, so we could see the failings, the sins of those individuals. It was wrong, it was wicked, and God's always been against it. And I'm glad that God's Word doesn't cover up things like that. Even in the New Testament. Have you noticed that in the New Testament, that when people are wrong, I mean, how many times did Peter get called out for being wrong about something? How many times? I mean, over and again. Uh, look at Lazarus. I, I heard somebody last week, and I don't remember if I was in a preaching service or something like that where Lazarus was being mentioned, and they said that Jesus, uh, Jesus cried over the death of Lazarus. In other words, Jesus loved Lazarus so much that he cried when he died. Well, actually, no. Jesus wept, the Bible says, because of the unbelief of the people. Because Jesus had said he's not dead, and yet they all believed he was dead, and Jesus wept over their unbelief. What's well, a good example of bad examples? Isn't it? Uh, 
Remember in the, in the New Testament church, Jesus Christ had ascended to heaven. You remember when Peter and Paul were together with the Jews and the Gentiles? And Peter dissimulated or he, he separated himself. He acted like he was just a Jew and the Gentiles were unclean. Remember Paul rebuked him? See, the Scripture accurately records failings of individuals. And the reason it does so is because it reflects the fact that we have a perfect God. And it reflects the truth that my worth and your worth and my merit and your merit is not earned through our perfect records. Our worth and our merit is only earned through the person of Jesus Christ who is the only perfect person to ever live. And so last week when we preached the message and we looked at Matthew chapter 1, specifically at the matter of the virgin birth, the prophecy of the virgin birth, and the fact that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, you and I were left with two choices. We can look at the facts and believe them, or we can look at the facts and reject them. But the truth is, is that God's Word prophesied that Jesus Christ would be born of a virgin, and Jesus Christ could not have been God, He could not have even been a good person, unless He... The virgin birth was the truth. And so as believers, we ought to know what the Scripture teaches about this, and we ought to be ready to give an answer for it the same. Excuse me. So here we are in uh, Matthew chapter 2 today, and I want to look at an example of belief, an example of unbelief, and it's actually ironic when you think of it. It's ironic that the individuals we look at as the examples of those who believe are the men who came from the East that the Bible calls wise, and the, the individuals who are troubled and who don't believe are the individuals in verse 3, Herod the king and all of Jerusalem with him. That is, if anyone should have been thrilled that God the Son had come in the flesh, it should have been the dwellers at Jerusalem. And if anybody should have been a skeptical or disbelieving, it should have been the people that would have come from the east or from Babylon, actually. Friend, I find great comfort in that fact. I find great comfort in the truth. Now, I'm not of those that would say that Jews don't believe in Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I, I am frustrated frequently with Jewish-focused ministries that would emphasize that Jews don't get saved today. The fact of the matter is that Jews get saved, I think, every bit as frequently as Gentiles do. And I believe they get saved a lot more frequently than most people believe. It's simply uh, one of the things that we don't realize is how often Jewish believers identify with the uh, dispensation that they're living in. That is, they get saved as part of the church and they're part of the church. And so they don't emphasize their Jewishness. Where did the church begin? I always have to ask this question. Where did the church begin? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Church did not begin at Rome, my friend. The church began at Jerusalem. Who was saved in the first church? For how long was it exclusively Jews? Well, actually, almost a couple of years. That it was only Jews that were part of the church. So for anyone that believes that the church belongs somewhere in Russia or somewhere in Germany or uh, somewhere in Italy, and that's, the, that's where the church's hub or its home is, my friend, read the Scriptures sometime. Find out where the church came from. If there were that kind of a universal church then my friend, it would be at Jerusalem. That's where the church began at. That's where it had its foundation at. Not one of these other locations. They weren't Italians that started the church. They were Jews. I'm not being silly. I'm being serious about it. It's because it's really a, it's a serious discrepancy that like millions of people just overlook as though it were nothing. It's a big deal, isn't it? Okay, so the first people that got saved were Jews. So let me ask you a question. How receptive are Jews to the Gospel? Well, it's an, it's an individual thing. It's an individual thing. I found that when I preach the gospel to Jews, that there is uh, there are two responses that I get. They either reject it or they receive it. But I found both. I remember the first time <laughs> that uh, I think the first no, it wasn't the first time I led a Jewish person, Lord, because back in Kansas I led an old man on his deathbed to the Lord who was Jewish. But I remember the first time in southeast Florida where there's a lot of Jewish population uh, to the Lord. I remember we were at the mall. I, we used to take, in our youth group, we would take our teenagers to different malls, and I would just cut them loose, our teenagers, and we would have like maybe 2,000 tracks. And if you take like 30 kids and give them each 100 tracks, you can just blow through the mall, and then security would come and say, hey, you can't be doing that. We'd say, oh, and we'd leave. 
And so we would do that. We just literally get out thousands of tracks really fast. So I remember going and starting going them all, and I approached a group of young people, some teens, some young adults, and I just gave them tracks. I just I usually don't say anything. I just hand them tracks real fast. Then I'll say something once they've already got tracks because I want them to have the gospel in their hands. Even if they reject Jesus, then I can just walk away and they, they either put it in their pocket and take it home. Usually they'll read it later. I read everything anybody gives me. So I always try to just get them the gospel regardless. But I remember handing it to them, and one of the girls that was there read it. The back, she said, you know, West Park Baptist Church was our name on the track. She says, oh, I, I can't take this. I'm Jewish. And I said, well, you still need to be saved. And she didn't have an answer for that. She'd been told, hey, you can't go to church. You know, you can't to go to the Baptist church. You can't all the things that they say about Baptists because, you know, they're Baptists because of these reasons. I said, well, you still need to believe in Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, it was one of the most true things anybody could have told her. There wasn't anything I could show her from Isaiah or from other portions of the Scriptures about her Messiah that would cause her to believe in Jesus more than just a heart's attitude to receive Him. And I have seen so many people from that simple answer turn to Jesus instead of arguing and debating and trying to show facts. Listen, are there facts if somebody wants them? Every Jew I know, every Jewish person I know that has looked for the facts has come to a place of faith in Jesus Christ. Facts are there. But the question is whether there's a heart to believe. And you know it's the same thing with Gentiles, with non-Jews. You're not going to get anywhere with somebody that doesn't want to believe. But if you can tell somebody, you know there's a God, and Jesus is God, and I can show it to you if you just be willing to, to be open-minded enough, my friend, that person will trust Jesus. And so here we find that some men from the east came. They would have been, we understand, from Babylon. And they would have been individuals that believed that the Bible, that the Scripture was the Word of God. Look with me in chapter 2, if you will, at verse 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now the word behold simply means look. Pay attention. It's kind of an attention-getting word. Behold... There came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, and anybody who's actually thinking and not just reading the words would say, okay, look, wise men came to, from the east to Jerusalem. You have to say, what in the world did they made them do that? Why in the world did those guys come from the east to Jerusalem? Well, they explain. They said in verse 2, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Okay, so they came to see the king of the Jews. In our youth group right now, we're preaching through Daniel. We're looking at a lot of things in Daniel. And we've been looking actually at Nebuchadnezzar, who said about God that he was, he was, he was saying in his praise to God that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is forever. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said about God. Nebuchadnezzar would have gotten introduced to God by the only truth-telling wise man in his nation, Daniel. And Daniel introduced him to God and proved that God was God through the visions uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel was able to just show him the answer to. And when Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God, he came to the place that he said, the God, Daniel, and he used in the phrase, small g, there's no gods or there are no gods like Daniel's. But Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that Daniel's God was God. He was the God. He was the only true God living God. And he praised and glorified him as a non-Jew. Daniel was some, something uh, in Babylon. In every king, both in the Babylonian kingdom and the Medo-Persian empire to follow that, Daniel was noted. He was notable because of what? Because his God was real. And Daniel was given at the end of the 70 year captivity, if you were to read Daniel 9, we've preached through it. If you want to find a message we preached recently on it, it would have been this last, uh, I think, December or January when we were preaching on prophecies of the Messiah. We preached through Daniel chapter 9 and showed how the Scripture explicitly showed the number of years until Christ would come in Daniel chapter 9. You can find that on YouTube. If you want to know how to find it on YouTube, Tony could help you with it. So that's Tony, and he could help you if you want to find the answers. Uh, that I, I don't have time to preach that this morning, and you should be glad. Um, so in Daniel chapter 9, the Scripture very, very explicitly says that there would be 70 weeks minus one week in which God is going to work 
And that the 70 years of captivity, which Daniel believed the scripture was prophesied in Jeremiah, that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. When that came to the end, then Daniel was told there are 70 more weeks minus one, and it came down to 490 years. And in that 490 years that was prophesied in Daniel, these wise men who knew that Daniel's God was God, these men from Babylon read what the scripture said and they believed it. And they literally were looking forward to the coming of the King of the Jews, the Messiah. These are guys from Babylon, not Jews. But they know on the basis of what God has done, and they know on the basis of knowing who God is, that He's the King of the Jews, that the prophecy that was in Daniel would be fulfilled. And they had it. It was their Scripture. They had read the Scripture. Now, friend, let me ask you a question. Why did these men from Babylon come this far seeking the Savior? The simple answer is to, that they wanted to. In other words, these were men that were seeking to worship God. You say, well, Pastor, I mean, Daniel had really impressed them. And I, I'm just telling you, Daniel, Daniel had died some 400 years before this. He'd been off the scene for 400 years. They weren't personal acquaintances of Daniel, but they were impressed by God. They had a knowledge of God in their hearts, and as they sought God, they <coughs> looked for truth. And when they looked for truth, they found God's Word. And when they found God's Word, they believed it. And when they believed it, they acted on what they believed, and they recognized it's time for the king to come. Look, there's a star in the east. And they went to find it. And where did they go? Well, they went to the people who should have believed. And they said, where's the king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. Now it's interesting that the star from the east had been there before Christ was, or before the wise men came. They came because they saw the star. But it's interesting that the people who were where the star was, it hadn't occurred to them that anything at all was going on. In other words, the people at Jerusalem were troubled because the wise men came, but the star's appearance hadn't meant anything to them at all up to that point. Why? Because they weren't looking for a Savior. You know, you'll be surprised at what God is doing in individuals' lives. Maybe you wouldn't if you know what God's doing in your life. But when you see what God is doing in individuals' lives to point them to Him, it isn't surprising that people are looking to Him come to Him. I love hearing testimonies. This is the last month I've heard testimonies of so many people that have recently come to know Jesus. And I just love the common things in their testimony. This happened in my life, and I was an atheist, or I didn't believe in God, but this happened in my life, and I began to realize that if there was this much evil, then there must have been a God. Or if there was, uh, that if there was anything, whatever. And I started to look at who God was, and all of a sudden my eyes were open, and I heard the Scripture, and these circumstances happened, and I found Jesus. And that was the way for the wise men. These wise men came from the east knowing that there was a God seeking him and the people who were where he was didn't even know he was there. <coughs> but when the wise men came seeking him, their presence troubled Herod and all of them that were at Jerusalem. Literally the people who should have said, here he is, here's his star, let's worship him. Now we know that the shepherds worshipped him, don't we? We know that, uh, that when He went into the temple after the eight days of purification, that those in the temple worshipped Him. We, we recognize that. We're not saying nobody recognized God. But my friend, it is surprising, isn't it, that those that are near and those that ought to know are not necessarily the ones who believe. And it has nothing to do with the facts. It has everything to do with the circumstances in your life or your response to the circumstances more so. So, Herod's response or the response of the unbelievers. Now, I want to point this out lest we miss this important point. Unbelief does not happen because the facts are insufficient. Did you hear me this morning? Unbelief does not happen because the facts are insufficient. In other words, I've had people say something like this many times to me. I wish I could believe, <coughs> but I just can't. You ever had somebody say something like that? Well, you know, that just sounds so good. It's too good to be true. I wish I could believe. In other words, you're an idiot, and you have a very, very small brain, and, uh, you know, you just you, you believe fairy tales easily, and I just can't. I'm too intelligent to just believe something. Well, I'll just be honest with you. The truth of the matter is, 
is that anybody who wants to believe can. So it's a very, again, it's one of those questions or one of those statements that's not honest. It's not an honest thing to say when you say, if I could believe, I would. No, if you could believe, you would, if, if you would believe, you could. That's the right way to phrase it. Not if I could, I would. If you would, you could. That's the truth. That's the reality of it. Many times people want to think somehow in their mind that God is going to excuse their arrogance in the claim that they're too intelligent to believe in Him. When the reverse is actually true. Okay, so look at this. In verse 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. What troubled Herod? The birth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, the thing that upset Herod was that Jesus Christ was born. Who was Jesus? He was God's son born of a virgin. In other words, Herod, we know, did not believe in Jesus. But what we think sometimes about Herod was that Herod did not believe in the existence of Jesus. Well, let's actually look at Herod. Uh, in verse 12, the Bible says, being warned, of, speaking of, of the wise men, being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed in their own country, into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled that it, which was spoken of the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Another message, but Hosea 11.1 1 is the prophecy of the Scripture, and there are individuals who don't want to believe that Hosea 11.1 1 is a prophecy of Christ, as well as a historical reference. But it is. But verse 16, notice, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Now here's the question. Did Herod know when Jesus should be born? Yes, how did he know? Because he inquired. Yeah, he asked the wise men, and they showed him the Scripture. So on what authority that did Herod know that Christ had been born? The scripture. The Scripture. So did Herod believe that the Scripture was inspired in the Word of God? Yeah. yeah. Did Herod trust Jesus for his Savior? No. No. no, he did not. My friend, what you do with Jesus has nothing to do with the facts. Whether you accept or reject Jesus is exactly the same as Herod. Herod knew for a fact that the Scripture said that Christ would be born. And he believed the fact of it enough that he had every child in Bethlehem and in the coast of Bethlehem under the age of two years put to death. And in doing so, he, he fulfilled the prophecy of the Scripture that would be weeping and wailing at the birth of Christ. He was instrumental in fulfilling prophecies about Jesus. Because he believed what the Scripture said about the birth of Christ, and because he acted on his unbelief in the person of Christ. And I want to say this morning that there may be in this place individuals who believe in the facts with a far friendlier, with a far friendlier consequence. In other words, I've met people that believe Jesus is God, but they've never believed in Jesus as their Savior. And my friend, those things are every bit the same as Herod believing in God and not believing in Jesus as his Savior. See, factually, practically speaking, Herod knew that Jesus was God and his actions proved it. You know, there are individuals who are lost as can be that believe that Jesus is God and their actions prove it as well. And yet, for the very same reasons, you may say, well, that's very sinister of Herod. Well, Herod was, of course, threatened, was he not, by Jesus? In other words, Jesus wasn't a personal threat to Herod. Supposing at Jesus' birth, Herod had gone along with the wise men, and he'd followed the star, and he'd come to the place where Jesus was, and he'd bowed down, and he'd offered gifts, and he'd worship Jesus, how would God respond to Herod? Jesus would be his Savior just like he is mine. But Herod's issue was that Herod wanted to be the king and he wanted to displace the true king. 
You know that's the reason, that's the motive behind most people who reject Jesus for their Savior. Sometimes they'll couch their unbelief or they'll cover their unbelief in phrases such as, I wish I could, but. But the reality of it is, is that Jesus Christ being God would displace the person who's on the throne in your life and that's yourself. And Herod was unwilling to worship Jesus because he wanted to worship himself. He wanted to have the place of Jesus, both for himself and for others. And so this morning we see very, very simply a theme that we'll see recurring as we preach through the Gospel of Matthew. And that is that individuals who do not believe remain in unbelief not because they cannot believe, but because they're motivated not to. And the truth of the matter is they're not as open-minded oftentimes as they like to think that they are. Well, you know, I just, you know, all the facts, I just have a real hard time believing in God. My friend, if you weighed the facts, you'd have a hard time not believing in God. <laughs> you would. I've met people before that say, you know, the Bible's got mistakes, and I've never met anyone ever who's shown me a mistake. There are people that have books on their shelves that other people have written about mistakes in the Scripture, and they've never read the books. They just have them there to make, to make themselves feel comfortable so that they can believe that there are mistakes in the Bible. They've never read the book about the mistakes that they ever had, and they'd evaluated those accusations. They'd have found the Bible was without error. There are no mistakes in the Scripture. It's the Word of God. There are people who say it was just written by a man. They've never read it enough to realize that you know, as many men as God used to write it could never have had a common theme without contradiction. So it must be a supernatural book. I've never gotten to it. And many times I've had people tell me, I've read the Bible and so I'll quiz them. Well, tell me what you know then about Zechariah. You know, what does Romans chapter 1 say about your unbelief? They can't answer that question because they're not being honest. And anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus, my friend, I don't mean this to be unkind, but it's a fact, anyone who does not believe in Jesus is not being honest about it. Some more or less than others. Herod wouldn't have said there's no God. Herod, by his actions, would not have said there's no virgin birth. He believed in it enough to try to kill the one born of a virgin. But Herod, my friend, was an unbeliever. Not because of the facts, and not because of what he knew, but because of his choice. And we'll see, my friend, that unbelief has been, is, and always will be a choice of what you do with Jesus. You know, some people who are believers do the same thing with the Word of God, with truth in the Scripture. I don't know how many times I've showed people plainly what the Scripture says, and they'll say things like, well, you have to understand that was because of the culture of the day that God said that. No, God said it because there is no culture with God. See, God supersedes culture, doesn't He? You think you're so relevant right now, but the day will come when God will still be relevant and you won't. And that's been true many, many times. Yeah. Listen, we need to be biblically relevant, not culturally relevant. God's Word is not written on the basis of a culture. God's Word is based on the fact that He is an eternal God. And so it's relevant. And it means what it says. Sometimes Christians play the same game of unbelief. How about you? How about you? What have you done with the fact that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came to die for sin, who gave His life on the cross for sinners. We who all have sinned, He gave His life for us. He was buried and He rose again. And the Word of God plainly states that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What have you done about that fact? It's a fact. What have you done about it? Because the truth of the matter is you're either an unbeliever or you're a believer on the basis of a choice to receive Jesus as your Savior or to reject Him for the same. So there came a time when I was a youth, I was a child. I'm so glad it happened when I was a child. There came a time when I recognized that Jesus was God, that I was a sinner, and that I needed a Savior. I had already known that there was a God. I was, I was born that way. I was born knowing there's a God. The Bible says so, and that was my personal experience. There came a time when I had to deal with the fact that Jesus was God. And my response was, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I prayed and said something like this, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I'm asking you to save me. I want to be your child. It wasn't those words specifically. It's probably uh, somebody was helping me when I prayed. 
It might have been more words, might have been less words, but in my heart I wanted Jesus to be my Savior. And God saved me because of it. And that was when I was born again. And that's when the facts became personal and I became more than just a person who knew. I became a person who had gone from unbelief to belief in Jesus Christ. You may be here today and you think your unbelief is very friendly. You might think, well, I'm not aggressive about it. I'm actually pro-God. I'm pro-Jesus. Friend, if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're the same kind of an unbeliever that Herod was. You may not have babies murdered, but you will, uh, you will be every bit as much an enemy of God as Herod was because you've rejected Christ for your Savior. Those are the facts. We'll see them again and again as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. The question is, do you believe them? Because that's a choice. Father, thank You for the truth of the Scripture. Lord, I ask that You would cement in our minds the motive behind unbelief, the motivation behind our unbelief. And God, for any person that's here this morning that thinks that God, the choice of receiving Jesus as their Savior is unimportant or unnecessary, I ask for the conviction and the help of Your Holy Spirit so that every one of us today will be able to know with a certainty that God is our Father, Jesus is our Savior, because we've received Him. Help us, help us in this matter. I pray for the convicting work of Your Spirit. Before I finish my prayer this morning, I want to ask that everyone keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed. And I would like to have a personal to private time with every person here. And if you would be so good as to not look around uh, when I ask these questions, because you would want privacy, and you should, of course, uh, give the same respect that you would want from someone else. I want to ask just a simple question today. And it's, it's, it's not a complicated one. It's actually one that you know, yes or no, is the answer to. And the simple question is this. Has there been a time when you've received Christ as your Savior? Has there been a time when you've received Jesus as your Savior? If you'd say, you know, Pastor, I can tell you when I was born again, and I know it's a fact that I received Jesus as my Savior. You just slip your hand up just so I can see it. Pastor, I know for sure I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. Okay, just slip your hands back down. Okay, if you'd be here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, at the very least, there's a great deal of uncertainty in my life. I do not know for sure that I am any different than Herod and those at Jerusalem who are troubled by the birth of Christ. Oh, I'm for Jesus. But I can't say that Jesus is my Savior, that I have prayed and asked God to save me because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross for my sins. If that would be you, you heard this morning, I won't call you out, I wouldn't embarrass you, but you'd say, you know what, I know that I need to do something about the facts. The fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I need to pray and trust Christ as my Savior. Pastor, would you pray for me? Don't embarrass me. But would you pray for me? I know I need to be born again. Just slip your hand up. Slip it up where I can see it and slip it right back down. Okay? Father, I thank You so much for the truth that we found in the Scripture today. And I ask that You would cement it in our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray that if there's any person here that does not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, they would not continue in unbelief. But they would simply be able to have the humility that Herod lacked. The inability to bow and to say, God, I need a Savior. Lord, I pray that You would help us all to recognize no individual is saved because of heritage. No individual is saved because of knowledge. But every person is saved because they want Christ to be their Savior and they receive Him. And I pray that You would just increase this truth in our hearts. Lord, I pray as well that the truth of what we've heard today would be something that would be so firmly involved in our thinking, become so firmly the way we think, that we would be able to more effectively preach Jesus to others. And that we would be able to understand unbelief better when people reject Jesus. And I just thank you so much for your word and what you've shown us here today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to end our service just a little different. We're not going to have a come forward invitation. I just simply want to mention the invitation to you. The invitation this morning would be for those that would perhaps feel uncomfortable that you wouldn't want to say, well, Pastor, I, I know that uh, I'm not saved. Maybe be uncomfortable uh, acknowledging that in a room full of people, but you know that you need to be born again. I want to let you know that the invitation never closes, even if a service does. Now, I've got a Bible. If you've got some questions, you have some things that are left unanswered, I've got a Bible. I'm not a know-it-all by any sense of the terms, but I'll just tell you something. I know the Bible has all the answers, and we can find your answers for you. If you want Jesus to be your Savior, my friend, you can be born again. God wants you to be. And that's God's will for your life. And so don't leave here without uh, talking to me. If you're a lady and you like to talk to a lady, my wife will be out of junior church or nursery or wherever it is that she's at this morning. I'm not for sure. Uh, but she'll be out and you can talk to her if you've got questions. My friend, 
uh, just just uh, understand and know this. Facts have nothing to do with what we believe, and that's the honest truth. Facts have nothing to do with what we believe unless we have a heart to believe the facts. If you want to know truth, you can. And you can be fully assured of it. You can know the fact that Jesus is God, the Bible is the Word of God, and that Christ is the only Savior, the only means for eternal life. And then you can have the confidence and be able to say with those who have believed, I know I'm on my way to heaven. I'll tell you something. Those aren't just words. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you know you have eternal life. And there is nothing more wonderful than having that thing settled forever. Settled forever. And it'll change your whole perspective on life. I'd like to dismiss with a word of prayer. So I want to ask Brother Charlie, if you would please, uh, dismiss us. Thank you.